ain't got no nursery, I can tell you. <laughs> well, this is mainly supposed to be fun, and I'm glad you're here. And of all the things I remember out of my life in the church, particularly the small country churches, which are such a rich part of my background and tradition, it was the very thing we're here around tonight, the all-day singing and the dinner on the ground. And I can remember my mother baking baked beans all day Saturday to take on Sunday, and they would be so thick by the time we got there, you had to chisel them loose to serve them. <laughs> People brought food that you would not believe, and after you ate it, you weren't certain. <laughs> but the all day singing and the dinner on the ground was part of my great tradition growing up in country churches. My father became a preacher when I was 15 years old and became immediately pastor of a little country Baptist church. We'll ordain anything willing. <laughs> my dad was pastor of the Mac Knight Baptist Church, the very first church he ever served, and I remember once in trying to make a big point, he split the pulpit in half. It was actually a little lectern. And he showered down on it with 275 pounds of authority and just <clears throat> split it in half and then punted it right out in front of the front row. <laughs> Said, I wish somebody around here would build a pulpit to take some preaching. And he was off and gone. They had to uh, preach long and hard. He'd get his big, thick family Bible up in his arm, keep his finger in it just in case he got to the text. <laughs> <laughs> he could sling sweat five rows making announcements. That, uh, the man could preach. I got my first start in church in uh, 
gospel music. My mother was a gospel quartet piano player. The woman could play it till the piano would beg for more. <laughs> kind of music you could have danced to if you hadn't been Baptist. <laughs> you know? The songs that I learned, sometimes I didn't always understand. You'd have a song like Rock of Ages that had a word like cleft in it. I didn't know what cleft meant. <laughs> Then you'd have the old rugged cross, and it had clinging in it. And I didn't know about cleft and clinging. Those were tough things for a three- and four-year-old kid. Mother taught me music by rote. And of all the songs my mama taught me, the ones that I especially enjoyed were the ones that talked about the by and by. Because by and by, I was going to grow up. Wouldn't have to stand at the end of that dumb piano and sing all the time. <laughs> but it was great fun. And these are some of my favorite special memories from out of my musical childhood. And I think you'll enjoy singing along on some of these. First one, just grab onto it when we get to the chorus. And I think you'll catch into this. This is probably one of the dearest old hymns we've ever sung. There's a land that is fairer than day And by faith we can see it afar For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet Shall meet on that beautiful shore. And this one is a really perky old by and by tune. It's like you want by and by to get here all of a sudden. And this is by and by when the morning comes. Just, just do the chorus with me, and about two times worth of that ought to get us ready for some real preaching. <laughs> so see if you can do it. Okay, bye. What, what's our good key? <clears throat> okay. Bye and bye when the morning comes. When the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome, and we'll understand it better by and by. One more time. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome, and we'll understand it better by and by. Terrific. Okay, give yourselves a hand. That's great. I have so many pleasant memories about country churches, but I suppose uh, one of the most awkward times at all for a Baptist minister is if something goes haywire in the baptistry or during the baptism. Now, about all the Methodists can do is drop the little cup, you know, <laughs> but... Uh, get a leak in a rubber glove maybe something like that but <laughs> see Baptists are a little bit more courageous we get right in there with these people and uh, I was practice baptized myself there are really no instructions in the Bible on how to baptize okay there's none we don't have a word on that we do know that the word baptize literally taken right out of the Bible itself means put them under till they bubble that's <laughs> The word actually means immerse or to dip, okay? And I thought about that. What if we had just used the word dip instead of baptize? I'd be a member of the Southern Dip Church. <laughs> the Southern Dip Convention, you know? President of our group would be the Big Dipper. That'd be kind of, you know, kind of weird. But there are absolutely no instructions in the Bible on how to baptize. We didn't give you any help with that. Uh, you're really very much on your own. Now, Gordon Renshaw was a ministerial student in a junior college in my hometown in Jacksonville, Texas, a little Baptist college where my father was going to school to prepare for the ministry. And, uh, <laughs> and one Saturday, Gordon called and wanted to know if I'd mind going out to Stryker Creek with him. 
because he had to baptize on Sunday afternoon. He'd never done it before. He was pretty nervous about it. So we went out to Stryker Creek, and I just wore a pair of old cut-off jeans and got out in the creek with him, and Gordon Renshaw proceeds to practice baptize and uh, almost killed me. Uh, I'll explain that to you. Anytime you baptize somebody in running water, and you may want to make notes here, anytime you're baptizing in running water, keep the top of the candidate's head upstream. That is terribly important. I cannot emphasize this enough. See, if I put your head upstream, that means the water will run over your nose and head on to the gulf or something. If I turn you the other way, the creek is going to run up your nose. That's when we tend to lose them. That's, that's what Gordon did to me, got me backwards, see, and I got, Wah! I thought I was gone. I came fighting out of there. And, no wonder they're Methodists, you know. I thought, you know, that <laughs> made good sense. But really, you get back, let's say, a little passing hunk of moss floating down the stream. And it socks it right in there in your nose, see? And you're not sure it's moss. And I think you'd want to know if it's moss. My feeling is you have every right to know. It's your nose. <laughs> Tell you one thing, you will seek to find out if it is moss. In fact, that's where we get Presbyterians from. I don't know if you know that. But Presbyterians are people that got dropped when they got moss up their nose. That's what the word Presbyterian means in the original Greek. Old moss in the nose. <laughs> that's a little bit weird. But when we first started bringing baptisms indoors, you didn't have a baptistry up high on the wall behind the choir where God meant for it to be. <laughs> Baptistries were cut in the floor of the pulpit area, generally. And it might be right under the pulpit, it might be to one side or right behind it, it might be off over to the edge, but on that platform area somewhere there was a hole cut out about eight feet wide, about four feet deep, and about five feet up second rib on the preacher. <laughs> and these little baptistries would be covered over with about a two by six lid, heavy two by six put together lid that would cover that hole. And it would have a carpet over it if you were in a more fortunate congregation. <laughs> now we've got a wire that runs right behind the baptistry parallel to the congregation. Then there's a little T intersection right over the baptistry that runs to the back wall. So you got a sheet that comes forward, you got a sheet that comes out from the right and a sheet from the left, and when those are pulled, there's a place on the right and on the left for the men and the ladies to dress for the ordinance of a baptism. <laughs> now while they're pulling the sheets, the song leader is up leading us in all the water music in the hymn book. <laughs> Showers of blessing, Jordan's stormy banks are standing. Shall we get in the river? And that, you know, anything with water in it, we sing at this point. Methodists at this time usually sing at higher ground. <laughs> and the song leader's out there just letting us have it. Now the preacher clears his throat behind the sheet. <clears throat> that says, I got my socks and my towel off, I got my khakis on, I'm ready. <laughs> song leader will stop at the end of the next verse and have everybody just sit down and be quiet they do and one of the young guys with his belt on his name on his belt gets up and goes over and pulls a handle on the big square D electrical box in the rear cuts off all the power except to the one lone yellow light bulb B-U-B -B, light bulb that's what we have in Texas light bulbs <laughs> Well, this yellow light bulb is swinging left and right because one of the guys hauling the pulpit bumped it, and there it is, swinging. You're sitting still, but the church feels like it's moving <laughs> left to right. Preacher comes down these little wooden steps into the water, leads us in a fervent prayer for these who've come to follow their Lord in the ordinance of baptism. Then he brings in Brother Hawkins. Brother Hawkins is going to be the first one to baptize tonight, and he comes into the water, turns, and faces the preacher's right. 
Preacher puts his hand on his back, arm up in there, in the name of the Father, and then puts him under, brings him up, splash like, and you a lot of splash in there. Kids all stand up in those old church pews, you know, you know, trying to watch. And any parent worth his salt will hold on a kid's belt loop during baptism, you know, because they can get loose from you and just can kill the spirit of the moment. So Hawkins goes splashing up the steps, slosh, splash, slosh, step, and he gets louder as he climbs higher because the water's falling further, splash, slosh, splash, slosh, as he comes up, goes through the sheets, splash, 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 kind of muffles it, but you can still hear through the sheets, splash, 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 splash. A few minutes later, squawk, has his shirt hitting the floor. <laughs> you, know, you hear everything through the sheets. <laughs> then he turns to Miss Middleton on his left, who's going to come out of the other side of the sheet. This is a Methodist lady who's finally seen the lights. <laughs> It looks like she's been staring at the bug. <laughs> just bug-eyed. She wants to do it again. No, just scared too, did And she kind of balks with her head out the sheet like somebody at one of those little carnival booths that you throw things at. You know, just didn't want to come through at all. So he reaches over to help her, and she just clonks him in the wrist bone with a fingernail. <laughs> and starts saying through her clenched teeth, I just can't do it, I just can't do it. Well... He tries to encourage her, you know, says, trust me, trust me, trust me, through his teeth. And kind of leans her on out a little to her, and she comes right on down the steps, scared to death. Well, she turns and faces the wall on the right. Puts his hand on her, <laughs> starts to put her under, and she keeps on, oh, I can't do it. And he says, trust me, trust me. Gets his in the name of the fire, and starts to put her under, and it was like bending a stump. <laughs> She was not going back, you know. Well, he tried again, and she would not move. <laughs> Had her legs apart, front to back, wasn't going. Well, he was tempted to reach out with his left foot and just, boom, kick him out from under her and take her on under for her own good. But he decided this should be her own free choice. So... What he did was he just caught her by the back of the head and the nose and just power plated her right in the water. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, and walked her back like you're laying an ironing board down. Well, the woman was just little trying to scream, but it had her mouth covered. And she couldn't, boy. And just as she was going under the water, she couldn't yell. Her eyes are about two inches around on each side. She wants to scream. She can't get it out. And as he's putting her under the water, she reached out and grabbed this sheet going across behind the baptist. And just twang, pulled it right down. Boom, it collapsed all over, right into bed. <laughs> all you could hear was screws flying and wires twanging. As it came down. Brother Hawkins was over here drying off. And he heard everybody laughing and he turned around to see what was wrong. There was nothing to do but right back in the water. <laughs> Feet first, just. <laughs> he personally baptized four rows. <laughs> Miss Middleton walked out on the water <laughs> and uh, went back to become a fine Methodist missionary. <laughs> Another part of the old country church that I enjoyed so much that we don't really get to celebrate quite as much anymore is the old homemade church pews now. <laughs> Here in the studio tonight we've got some makeshift benches as my dear friend Clark Dawson would call them, some benches. <clears throat> uh, these are assembled and stacked up for us. But the old country church pew was something all its own. These were built by people that specialized in chicken coops. <laughs> It really doesn't do much good to specialize in homemade church pews because they're not going to build many in your vicinity in your lifetime. So you don't need a lot. Pews were anywhere from 12 to 14 feet long. Usually they had a solid end piece and a solid center piece. Then there was a section cut into that for the seat bottom and a section cut up the back for the back support. 
and the seat and the back were made out of very flexible, occasional one-by-twos. <laughs> and between the one-by-twos, you're on your own. I mean, you sat down and got up easy on those things, you know, you snag your nits or something, you know, it's kind of weird. Now, anytime you're sitting on those old homemade church pews, you really had to kind of keep your eye open at all times, because let's say you might be sitting across the center divider of that old homemade church pew from the church heavy lady, Miss Hawkins. She's a dear woman, she used two fans every service, you know. But Miss Hawkins was a dear old lady, and she was one of those people who uh, couldn't, <laughs> well, she couldn't cross her legs, okay? She just crossed her ankles. <laughs> and kind of laid them right out in front of her, ka-thump, ka-thump, right out on the floor. And would sort of slide out on the edge of the pew and fan with two fans, you know, bless her heart. Couldn't get her hose all the way up, just stopped under the kneecap. <laughs> Looked like she's smuggling sausage, you know what I mean? I always love that. I always wondered what pantyhose have done to those kind of ladies. You know, that's, that's back when you bought hose one leg at a time, and uh, now you go on to group rate or you don't get them at all. Just wondered if they roll those under the knee, they have to hobble to walk. You know, kind of strange. But you always kept your eye on the church heavy lady, Miss Hawkins, if she's sitting on your pew. And the reason for that, she kind of took up the other half with her two little children, you know. And you watch her all the time, kind of keep one eye peeled over there, because sooner or later she's going to shift her weight to the other side of herself. And you've got to be ready, because when she moves, your end of the pew is fixing to go, woo -hoo, you know. That is absolutely true. <laughs> Some of the most special things that ever happened in my life were getting in touch with the great old hymns with deep meaning and purpose. I guess every time we've ever taken a survey of the most beautiful hymns to us in all of the annals of Christendom, there are a few that float to the surface. We love Amazing Grace. Uh, we love In the Sweet By and By. Uh, two I'd like to do for you are special favorites of mine and I'll need a little help on the chorus of the first one this one is called In the Garden and should be done as a duet <laughs> and I will do my very best I come to the garden alone while the dew
Oh, that's beautiful. And I guess the other one that uh, has been the most requested among many of us for years, the beautiful old Rock of Ages. And this is a quartet special, if I ever heard it. In your hearts, you'll have to imagine me as a quartet. <laughs> Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let fun in the country church and in all my experiences in church, it largely grows out of the fact that we do such crazy things in church, and they're things that we can all get tickled at. And I feel any time we take ourselves so seriously in church that we can't get tickled at the things that we really do, we've missed it. Uh, some people don't think there's any relationship between humor and faith. I have people say to me every now and then, do you think God has a sense of humor? Uh, nobody ever asked me that question who was smiling at the time. <laughs> I always want to say, have you looked in the mirror? Because <laughs> see, if God thought that up, he's got a terrific sense of humor. And I know if he's seen it, he at least laughs. <laughs> now, people who want to get so somber about faith that they can't enjoy some of the joy of what's there, I think have really missed out on a lot of the good times <laughs> in the church. And I was in church when people just kind of had fun doing the old ordinary stuff. Uh, one of the favorite stories of my life was about the little country church had just gone on, REA, and uh, they just absolutely let the coal oils go dry-wicked on them. You know, they didn't have any more lamps, no candles, no nothing. And they were just enjoying full electric. One Sunday night, the power went out during the storm, and it was just pitch dark. And since people weren't supposed to smoke, they didn't even have matches with them. You know, just in there in the church, just, oh no, pitch dark. Pastor, quick-thinking young minister trying to be in control of the moment, suggested that they simply take a few moments and uh, bow their heads in silent prayer. So there in the pitch dark, they all just... <laughs> See, I mean, you could open your eyes and you wouldn't even know it. <laughs> well, old Brother Hawkins was one of those kind that always dozed off about, oh, four or five minutes into the sermon. He was already gone over here leaning against the window. <laughs> You know. <laughs> well, he got real still, and that woke Hawkins up. And he woke up in the pitch dark all by himself. And he jumps up and says, well, they went off and left me. <laughs> Those are the kind of moments that really make church kind of fun. I love that. 
prayers are always kind of fun. I loved it when the preacher would call on some fellow that didn't pray normally in public, <laughs> or he may have normally, just didn't pray in public. And he'd say, Brother Simpson, would you please lead us in a word of prayer? There. Oh, he, the guy's over here, you know, he cannot do this. He, you know. And he's terrified, mortified. Now, there was a way out of that in the little country church. If you didn't pray and you called on, the way out was to say, beg to be excused. Some of you remember this. And uh, you do it quickly enough, as you bow your head and you go, beg excuse, kind of like that. <laughs> and sound like you sneeze and you can't do it because you got sinus. You say, beg excuse, kind of like that. <laughs> I think the greatest response to that I ever heard, the old fellow was called on to pray in church and he didn't pray. Brother Simpson, now lead us in prayer. See? Everybody bowed their head. <laughs> Simpson stood up and said, let us pray. Everybody bowed their heads. He went home. <laughs> Just left it. Wouldn't you love to do that just one time? Just walk out and leave them sitting there. Can't peek because nobody said amen yet, you know. Just, Another one of my favorites is a good friend of mine in Texas. I'll call him Brother Randall. But Brother Randall was one of these kind of pastors who's effervescent and, you know, always up into it and just glorious. Everything's wonderful. You know. <laughs> they didn't need a PA system for him. They put a sock in his mouth. I mean, you know, that he's overdone. He'd just become pastor of a church in the Dallas area, and on his very first Sunday as the pastor came out and they sang one of those great opening hymns, Marching to Zion. Everybody was up and going, and he had his hymn book in two hands just parading around on the platform, singing gloriously. A few moments later, they uh, finished the hymn, and he called on one of the good brothers in the church after they all had been seated. He calls on Brother Hawkins to lead in a word of prayer. Bowed his head as did the whole church, and Hawkins just <gasps> gasped. See, now Hawkins doesn't pray in public, but he is the chairman of the pulpit committee that has just called this minister to be the new pastor of the church. And he doesn't want the pastor to know that he doesn't pray in public this way. What he wants to do is have him over for a big roast chicken dinner or something and say, incidentally, there are a lot of fine young people in this church that need experience in prayer. So, you know, really I've had my share of that and, uh, you know. So that's how he's going to let the pastor know he doesn't pray in public. Well, he hadn't gotten to the preacher yet. The preacher knows Hawkins real well because he's chairman of the committee, see. So he says, Brother Hawkins, well, now lead us in a word of prayer. And everybody about there says, Oh, Hawkins is... <laughs> so he grabs a pew in front of him and he's really in turmoil because he doesn't want to embarrass himself. Well, he has heard enough blessings and enough offertories in his time to be able to fake it through a couple of bless our missionaries and follow your provisions and sit down. So he white knuckles the pew in front and comes about two-thirds of the way up just trembling in his high-top dress shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and starts his prayer. <laughs> Father, <laughs> thank you. And he can't get through. He's just choking right there. And uh, Brother Randall up on the platform realizes that Brother Hawkins is choking on prayer. <laughs> so he tries to encourage him. And every time old Hawkins stops to catch his breath, Brother Randall bursts forth with a great, Amen! <laughs> or Hallelujah! And, uh, oh yes! <laughs> well, Hawkins would just nearly jump out of his dress shoes, you know, every time that would happen. So the previous pastor had been here 30 years and hardly ever raised his voice in the service. And here's old Hawkins jumping out of his hide. And the church going, what is this, what is this, you know. Well, about five or six of those big oh yeses and amens and hallelujahs, and Hawkins started thinking, hey, this isn't as tough as I thought. Preachers grin with everything I say. So old Hawkins would go, oh, Lord, everything, and he'd go, oh, yes, and the Lord, amen, and the Lord, the hallelujah. Well, I mean, it just got to be, and the Lord, and the Lord, and the Lord, and the back. Well, the church is peeking too eyed, man, just golly. And it was like watching a fast ping pong match, you know, just back and forth, oh, yes, hallelujah, and the Lord, and we thank thee, oh, yes, back and forth, back and forth. Well, 
Well, old Hawkins was really firing on, just building up to a mighty crescendo. And he comes to the conclusion of his prayer in the Lord's name. Amen. And he finished, you know. And old Randall goes, Amen. <laughs> and moving around up there, sat down and missed his chair. <laughs> just <laughs> flat out in the floor. <laughs> we need to wind up on an upbeat. I've got uh, two or three things selected here for you. This is one of the great hymns, and it ought to have pep, and it ought to have vitality. So join in and give me a good clean shot now. Let's sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. We're leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace of mind. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Now everybody, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from. Uh, last one, I guess, is probably uh, been banjo picked and bluegrassed and uh, guitared and organed and pianoed about as much as any song in church. And we've had fun with it and we've finished up camp meetings with it and we've done all kinds of things. I'll fly away, old glory. And uh, if you're not ready to fly away, old glory, you're in trouble because uh, this crew is going to move on with this song. It's number 156 in your hymn books. Turn over in your hymn books. <clears throat> I will fly away. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Some glad morning when this life is over, I fly away to that home on God's celestial shore. I will fly away. Now get into this. Come on. I Come on, I'll 